this one to the microphone. Yeah. This is Zoom. You're doing Zoom. Yes. This is Zoom. Your platform. Let me look at what. This Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for just the soft rain that's pouring down. Lord, I know the farmers are hoping for some dryness so that they can get in their crops. But Lord, we just pray that you pour out your spirit just like you're pouring out this rain. Lord, be amongst us tonight, wherever we may be. And Lord, for those who will watch us later, be amongst them as well. Pour out your Holy Spirit on each and every one of us. Just open our hearts and minds to what you have in store for us tonight. And Lord, may we glorify you by our conversation. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I seriously considered saying, we'll just call in and we can do it all by a Zoom last week. But we were walking along the, the National Mall and it, you would not have been able to see anything because it was black all around us. And I didn't know who would be here to put it up on the screen. And plus, this thing isn't working right. So, but thank you for allowing us to take a, a week away. Uh, we had a good trip. Way too much stuff for the trip. If you're not on Facebook, find somebody as you can see all the pictures. There's, we did too many things. But I am glad to be back. I love studying the word with you guys. And so I hope that you're ready. Um, the one thing I will say is I don't know that we'll get through both chapters tonight we might but i have a question for you my original goal was to deal with the first 11 chapters of genesis what is called prehistory uh, we can know for certain or relatively for certain about abraham forward genesis chapter 12 on now at genesis chapter 12 it gets into far more storytelling there's a lot going on there but it's it's more just the story. And that we'll still be able to dig into that. If you guys want to continue to do that, I would love to do that with you. If you'd like to dig into something else, we can do that as well. But I grabbed these first 11 chapters of Genesis on purpose because I wanted you to get a sense that we can really dig into Scripture. That there's more there than just the story that we tend to read and gloss over. Does that make sense? So... If you want to continue Genesis, great. If you think it'd be better to hop to something else, we can do that as well. Does that make sense? But I, I at least want to go through the end of chapter 11, because the other side of that is these first 11 chapters, what they call prehistory, also point to everything that we need to know about the human condition. It gives us everything we need to know about God and how God is pursuing us, and it gives us everything that we need to know in order to read the gospels and realize what in the world has actually happened. Now there's some other pieces that you have to read through the rest of the Old Testament to get, but as a whole, if you just read these first 11 chapters, then the whole story makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, so far we've gone through chapter nine and we've seen the human condition play out already in a couple of different ways, haven't we? We see how we mess it up, how we're the ones who walk away We've seen how we, we've been begging. I, I keep wanting to look. I can't help but now think of, of you, Chris. You keep saying, when is someone going to turn around? You know, we see this human condition where we, we just can't seem to get out of our own way and turn back to God. And yet we also see how God is constantly <laughs> pursuing us. And that's not necessarily the way I was brought up in the faith. That's not the, I mean, Yes, I was taught that God is always loving. I was taught that God is always kind. But there seemed to always be a disconnect from the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And yet when you read these first 11 chapters, you see that that's not the case. That just as in the Gospels, when Jesus sees people for who they are, people who are not seen, people who are not known, you see that God here at the beginning of the story too. Wouldn't you agree? 
So again, think about it. If you want to continue with Genesis, well, I'll be glad to. But if there's some, if you've got a hankering for something else, we can do that as well. Make sense? All right. We'll start with Genesis chapter 10. And my book just says verse one is my first paragraph. These are the descendants of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Children were born to them after the flood. So the reality is, at least from a human perspective, no kids were born on the ark. Does that make sense? Anything else you notice about this, or do we go ahead and read the next section? So far, we got the three boys, but their wives, which don't get named, they're they're a part of the story too. Well, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll let the ladies make that comment. I can get in trouble for making that comment. Let's read the next paragraph. The descendants of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The descendants of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rapheth, and Togmara. The descendants of Javan, Eliash, Tarshish, Kidim, and Rodin. These From these, the coastal people spread these are the descendants of Japheth in the lands with their own language by their families and their nations. This is a dividing of the nations. Yes. We're not there yet. Because in chapter 11, we get the Tower of Babel story. So there will be a reality. What you have to know about chapter 10 is chapter 10 is like an editor's note in the story. We haven't progressed any in the story from chapter 9 to chapter 11. It's just the editor telling us about the descendants of these three boys. Does that make sense? The story of chapter 11, when you actually get to the Tower of Babel, it's happening actually the storylines probably happening at the same time of what we're talking about in chapter 10, or even maybe just a hair before because of that reality. Ultimately, these peoples will separate. They're going to have their own languages. They're going to have their own nationalities, their own identities. But prior to chapter 11, they all have one language and they're all one people because they're all the children of Noah. Does that make sense? What else do you notice in this? Anybody? They were in cultural. So we're talking about a differentiation of culture here. Most of these people are coastal people. They like the beaches. They're probably, I don't know why after spending almost two years in a big boat, I mean, it's not really a boat, you know, the ark, the, the big tomb that they had want to go back to living along the water. But apparently most of these descendants did. Maybe it felt comfortable, you know, after you're seeing water for two years and then go back to dry ground. There's just something familiar about being next to the water. Get used to it, is that what you said? Yeah. Any other thoughts? So before we move too much further, I, you know me, I like to, to sketch things out. So I did some pre-work and I cheated. I'll be honest with you. I drew a map. <laughs> 
We have turkey up here, and I probably should have it in a little better. We got some water, water, water. Here's Red Sea, Mediterranean Sea. That's the Black Sea, and the Caspian Sea. But I did some research because I was I I wanted to know where these people groups came from. You know what I'm saying? Or what they said. So we're going to start with we got here the descendants of Japheth, right? So can someone, Jim, since you brought up the coastland people, you want to give me a name and I'll chart them on the map, okay? Gomer. So Gomer is going to be up here. And we'll go up. Magog is going to be over here. Madai. Madai is actually going to be down here. Javan. Javan is over here in Greece. Tubal. Tubal is going to be up here. Mashish. Mashish. Tyrus is also the one here. So you can see how Japheth's sons kind of come up here to the north and they kind of migrate towards the water along the sea coast. Um, part of them also becomes Gideon, which we know as Cyprus. Thank you. All right, I have that final right there. Part of their offspring become the Philistines. They kind of fill this whole area up here to the top. That makes sense? Interestingly enough, they would say most of the people in this room, we are descendants of Jacob. Were fairer still. They kind of spread throughout Europe. <clears throat> does that make you question anything, or what does that make you think about? Well, traveling would have been very easy after the flood. Everything would have been completely different, absolutely. For certain about that. How would we know where they were going? Well, I don't think they would. That's part of it. Everything would have to be explored again. Well, and Don puts on here, and the way sailors like to the movement, they are constantly on the move. It, it makes sense that these descendants would just keep moving. They keep spreading out. They. You know, if you like to be on the water, you like to be on the water. You discover new places along the water. I would assume so. Yeah, fishing would probably be a, a common food source for them. Anything else? Or you want to read the next sign? Verse 6. The descendants of Ham, Cush, Egypt, put and Canaan, the descendants of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sapta, Raama, and Sabaka. The descendants of Rama are Sheba and Dedan. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He was the first on earth to become a mighty warrior. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. First of all, I just need to say pause. Nimrod does not mean a mighty hunter today, and this has always caused me to just want to laugh, but, but that's beside the point. It just goes to show you how things change. Anyway, verse 10. Sorry, I just got to show up. I have a childish side. Verse 10. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, and Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. From the land, he went to, into Assyria and built Nineveh. Rehoboth, Ir, and Kala, 
and resin between Nineveh and Cala. That is the great city. Egypt became the father of Ludin, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuim, Puthrasim. I'm getting, getting to the end of my abilities here, guys. Kaslehim and Kaftorim, from which the Philistines came. So now we've got Ham's kids, right? And I'm not going to ask you to read them because they get a little crazy. But interestingly enough, it, my Bible went ahead and translated it. But it, does anybody not say Egypt? What's yours say? M I Z R A I M. So it's pronounced Mitzrayim, which literally means the dwelling place of Ham. The Egyptians were the oldest sons of Ham. Which, of course, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, where Ham's the one who is not seen very kind like, then it makes sense that the Hebrew people and the Egyptians would not get along. Does that make sense? So you get Egypt. Canaan, all the businesses this way, Cush is down this way. Avila, Of course, there's more that are this way. They kind of go towards Africa and down. Um, most would say Ham's kids tend to be darker skinned. The Arabs, you know, all of them have kind of a darker complexion. Many of them in the Africa, the blacker, darker skin, and so see them kind of spreading out. I don't know, it may not be, this may not be interesting to you, but it was interesting to me. What else do you notice when we talk about? Well, and someone brought that up earlier. And the reality is these are the sons by which nations are named after. And what I mean by that is there were probably many other sons and had to be many, many daughters for them all to get married and have kids and for, to rebuild the population. But these are the descendants who, according to the Hebrew people, became the fathers of nations. Um, there were probably lots of other unnamed people. And again, these, the, these areas, they will go by other names as well. But these are the Hebrew names for these city-states or countries, if you get what I'm saying. So more or less, these are the leaders then. These would be the leaders. Correct. You know, it, uh, a prime example of this is, um, and I'm jumping ahead, but if you were reading in the book of 1 Samuel, whenever uh, Samuel is sent to go crown the next king after Saul, he's sent to the house of Jesse. Well, Jesse is the father of the household. Anybody who came out of that household would be Jesse's boy. And if Jesse's clan settled in an area, it would be Jesse Town or Jesseville. That would be what it was called. Now you'd go to the first son first. The oldest, the firstborn would be the heir to the throne if they had a throne. They really didn't do thrones, but 
So whenever God goes all the way down to the eighth son, the pick David, that breaks with all kinds of traditions. All the rest of those sons could go off and, and start their own thing, but they wouldn't inherit their father's throne. Does that make sense? And so most of these are going to be firstborn sons, or they're going to be sons who exerted themselves and made something more than their station. Does that make sense? But this doesn't necessarily mean that each of these are like the first generation past Ham or the first generation past Jacob. Does that make sense? This is the line of the descendants. And we kind of talk that way some too, but we don't do it about our own history because America is only just about 300 years old. So we still talk about every descendant if they, unless they just don't make something of themselves at all. Does that make sense? So we can't look at chapter 10 as being in linear fashion. Does that make sense? This is, this is covering huge swaths of time. But it is starting to show you how the people are branching out all over the world. Does that make sense? Verse 15. Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvadites, the Zemurites, and the Hamathites. Afterwards, the families of Can the Canaanites spread abroad, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, and Sodom Gomorrah, Adma, and Zibelin, as far as Lasha. These are the descendants of Ham by their families, their languages, their lands, and their nations. That makes sense? John, you look puzzled. So some of these, and, and what you have here is you have a mixture of both people names and place names. And sometimes a, a place, like a city, is named after the person who founded it. So sometimes you'll see something that's a person's name that's also a city's name. So for instance, Moving forward, a place that gets talked about a lot is in the northern part of Israel, up here by what I wrote it down. Meth is a city that in the way down the future will be called Dan. But in the book of Genesis, they still refer to it as Dan, even though it wasn't called Dan at that point. Because Dan is the seat of the tribe of Dan after the Exodus, when they take the land back. But that place became so associated with its new name of Dan that they went back and just said, it's trying, instead of trying to remember what the old name was, they just said, it's the city of Dan. Just, it's Dan. Um, a prime example, Melissa went to Washington High School, grew up in Washington, Indiana. But when it was settled, it wasn't called Washington. It's called Leavenworth, right? Liverpool, sorry, it's called Liverpool. But Liverpool is a good British name. And after the, you know, the Revolutionary War, you, you didn't want to live in a British place. We were Americans, so they renamed it to Washington. No one remembers it as Liverpool. But if you go through the history, you'll all of a sudden start reading stories about so-and-so from Liverpool, Indiana. I'm like, where in the world's Liverpool? That's the kind of thing that happens. Does that make sense? So some of these people, their name ends up becoming the na national name. In some ways, they, they wanted to call America Washington because he was the general that caused us to have freedom. Of course, smartly, we didn't name ourselves after a person. We did something else. Does that make sense? You kind of get what's going on here? So Canaan's descendants kind of take over this area. And that is why this region here it's called Canaan. It's given that name primarily because of the descendant of Noah from the family of Ham who settled this area. 
Now that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but we need to understand that because all throughout the rest of the book of Genesis, you're going to have Abraham, a descendant of Shem, who's living in Canaan, the descendant of Ham. And these two brothers did not get along. If we go back to, to chapter nine, do you remember that? So eventually, right. So that's that was the curse that Noah put on the family. And ultimately, there are some from Noah's side who would see themselves as being superior to the Canaanites. So it's perfectly fine for them to go in and just take their stuff because they're supposed to serve us anyway. By the same token, the Canaanites would absolutely resent anyone from Shem's family because, you know, grandpa and great-grandpa and great-great-grandpa tried to tell us, no, we're going to be subject to them. And no, we're not. We're going to stand our ground. We're not going to let that happen to us. And so there's this level of animosity that gets built up, but you don't fully understand that if you don't realize where people set it. Because whenever we start to talk about Abram, Abram, he's over here. And then he travels up here and then finally comes down to Canaan. He's an outsider, but he's an outsider from great, great grandpa's favorite child. And they still remember that. Does that make sense? And so when we read in the stories after in chapter 12 and beyond, when we're reading about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, there's family dissension going on that's building the story. Do you get what I'm saying? But if you didn't know that that's the that Canaan lands here and the other family lands over here, that it just kind of would go over our head a little. Does that make sense? But you, unless you ask the question, why is it that these two groups of people just really don't like each other? Other than the fact that it's clear Abraham's the outsider coming in. Does that make sense? I don't know. Is there anything that says that that, uh, that part of Noah was godly and righteous? I mean, he was, remember what it said. It said he was more righteous than everyone else in his generation. But what did it also say about everyone else who lived on the earth? Their thoughts were evil continually. You know, realistically, if we're grading on a curve, the person who gets a 66%, if everyone else has 50% or lower, they're the king of the class. Grant used to joke that he was 11th in his class, and it wasn't because he was smart. It was because everybody else was just that much dumber than him. <laughs> There's a sense in which, and that's one of the things we have to get clear. As we go through the Old Testament, when people are chosen by God, it's not necessarily because they are good in and of themselves. It just means that they're willing to say yes to God. It just means that they're, they're better than everyone else. Maybe they just listen to God a little bit more. And of course, all of them are very broken and fall, fallen people. No one outside of Christ is perfect. And so if you don't have that as your basis starting out, then you're going to misinterpret all of these people. Well, whenever David does the despicable things he is, well, he's a man after God's own heart. So that must be okay with God. No, that doesn't mean it's good with God. He just keeps repenting and saying, yep, I messed up. And he tries to keep coming back. That's the difference. The people that God chooses, the people that God uses, it's not because they're necessarily good people. It's because there are people who are willing to turn back to him. There are people who are willing to admit their faults, admit their shortcomings. Does that make sense? Does that help? It gives us a lot of hope, yeah. So that's why I wanted to kind of go through this and, and I'll read through the rest of these too. But I wanted you to understand part of what we see happening and this is, chapter is here to set the stage for the rest of Genesis so that we understand 
this family and these people groups, the Philistines and the Canaanites, who are some of the primary enemies of the Israelites, part of the reason is they're from the other two branches. They're not from the favored sons line. Does that make sense? And that's only because Noah said it. So this should be, it doesn't make it necessarily right. It doesn't make it necessarily good. But it should help us understand why these three groups of people don't like each other. That's what happens when parents play favorites. Now, sometimes the kids will be mature enough to move beyond it, but it doesn't always happen. And so for the rest of this book, we're going to see the family of Noah feuding against each other. And oftentimes it stems back to these three family groups. Because the green people, they become also the Romans and the Greeks. They don't, the Jews don't like the Romans and Greeks, do they? I mean, the red, like I said, they become Egypt, Egypt, and they become Assyria and Nineveh and Babylon. Here, here names that we know later on are just not liked very well. Does that make sense? We should not be old. I mean, when, when I think back, We always start with Shem, so that makes us think. I'm reading this, and I'm reading it like the genealogy part. It's flipped. Correct. So we we tend to think of Shem as the oldest because he's listed first. But there's a sense in which I think you might be right. Shem may actually be the youngest son because Japheth is the one who's mentioned first, then Ham, then Shem. And so if this is a genealogy, it would make sense that probably Japheth is the oldest son, Ham is the middle child, and Shem is the youngest one. But Shem is the one who's favored, and Shem is the one with whose line we're going to follow for the rest of the book. Now, by the same token, that probably shouldn't surprise you if you've read through the Bible at all, because God is notorious for choosing the younger son. He just does it over and over and over again, which... As an oldest son, it's just a little bit aggravating. And both, you're both the youngest and oldest son? Congratulations. You can war with yourself then. Yeah. <laughs> it, and, well, let's get down there. Where was, what verse am I at? Am I at 15? No, we did read that. 21. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The descendants of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. The descendants of Aram, Uz, Hol, Gether, and Mash. Arphaxad became the father of Shelah, and Shelah became the father of Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almodad, Shelpha, and Hazar Mavith, Jerah, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abim, Ab. Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the descendants of Joktan. The territory in which they live extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephar, the hill country of the east. These are the descendants of Shem by their families, their languages, their lands, and their nations. So just for the sake of finishing the chart, purple. As I so we got Lud over here, Asher, Elon, Baxan, 
become All right, so you got the purple people kind of here in the middle. These are the descendants of Shem. And so you have this area right here. This is the, the people group that, that ultimately Abram is going to come from. He's going to come around here, and that's going to set the stage. Does that make sense? Now, for the most part, these are just a lot of names to us, and they don't mean a whole lot, especially considering... All of this area now doesn't contain all those different nations. It, it's just Turkey to us. It's one big country to us. All this section here, most of these are the, are these purple people. Is actually what we would call Iraq. Over here, you know, we have Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. Our countries are much bigger than theirs were. But you can start to see just by looking at the geography how the families are kind of segregating themselves. Now notice in, uh, in verse 25, um, it mentions, it says, to Eber were born two sons, the name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jogtan. This tells us very clearly that chapter 11 is happening in Peleg's generation. Do you get what I'm saying? So everyone who is born before Peleg and Joktan, they're, they're still spreading out. Anyone who's born after them is a part of what happens at the Tower of Babel. Does that make sense? Have I lost anybody yet? I lost you. Do we need to read on to come back to that point then or? Or do you have a specific question that I can help clarify here? Well, I don't quite follow the thinking here. The two Hebrews were born two sons, the name of one was two things. So the work was invited. But what does Joktan have to do with that thing? I mean, I don't understand. Joktan has nothing to do with it other than the fact that there's, there's a reality about the ancient world where names had meaning. Remember, we, we kind of had that discussion, uh, you know, even about Cain and Abel and what their names meant. Well, it means division. That's, they're saying that on the earth. Well, the, the earth itself wasn't divided, but the humanity was divided. So maybe we need to go ahead and read into chapter 11 in order for that to make sense. And, and that's part of, and it might be that Peleg is the one who caused the division. He might be the one behind the Tower of Babel. But regardless, Peleg becomes synonymous with division. That word means divided. Now, whether it meant divided before that or not, we don't know. But his brother got no bad friend. But his brother, well, his brother became father of far more nations than Peleg. Apparently, Peleg wants, he must have caused the division. And after that, nobody wanted to have anything to do with him. So his line just got cut off. <laughs> So verse 32, these are the families of Noah's sons according to their gene genealogies in the nations and from these nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So I think, Lori, you were the one who pointed out and was it you the one who pointed out 21? The elder brother of Shem is the, somebody. Yeah. 
Okay, so Shem is older than Japheth, but we don't know where Ham is in the order. Ham could be the oldest. All we know is Shem is older than Japheth. This is, if this is one of those Einstein puzzles you used to do in school where they give you clues and you got to figure out, we don't have enough clues, do we? We just know that Shem is older than Japheth. But we don't know if Shem is the oldest or Ham is the oldest. So that means, let's just be clear, the Hebrew in this is a little unclear. And when they translated it, they made a decision. But the point is, we really don't know who's the eldest son, other than the fact that it seems, well, no, it doesn't even seem clear, because if some people are saying that Shem is the older and some are saying Japheth is the older, then we really don't know, do we? But what we can see is we have this kind of gathering of this family, and another gathering down here. We have a gathering up here of this, this family, a little bit here and there. And then we have the Ham family over here and down that way. What's clear to me is that after the flood, this area here in the middle was already probably becoming desert-like. Because notice nobody's settling there. And we know that now that's in the middle of Saudi Arabia and it's just not a good place for anybody to live. Now the map might not mean a whole lot, except for, like I said, I think we're seeing a setup here of a little bit of the tension between the people groups we're gonna read later on. Does that make sense? Any questions about chapter 10? Well, well, well. So I'll say those numbers again. Okay, it says the Japheth had 14 nations. So Japheth was green, right? At 14? 14 nations. Okay. Plus the 30 from Ham. 30 from Ham. And 26 from Shem. That adds up to 7. And this is one of the multiple of 10 and 7. Both numbers signify. Yes. So 7 and 10 are both numbers of completeness. So if there are 70 nations, <coughs> then this is a little more on the symbolic side than probably a list of every nation or every people. But we can at least see a division here of how things are kind of falling apart. Imagine a family that fights. That never happens, does it? Any other thoughts before we hop into... Chapter 11. All right. So I have one through nine as one paragraph. Does anybody else just divide that up? One through four? That sounds like a consensus. So we'll go with that. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. As they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bit them for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. 
So what do you see? What do you notice? What questions does it make? They're making a capital, yes. They're building with permanence. They're wanting to settle down and set roots. What else do you notice? There's a sense of pride that, with their statements, yes. Now, what do we know about pride? Is pride ever considered a good thing? I mean, there's a level of pride that's okay, but this seems to already be going beyond that, doesn't it? Anybody take any no, any uh, qualms with verse four? And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Well, let me well, keep your finger there and let's go back to Genesis chapter one. And let's look in particular at day six and Let's look at verse 28, Genesis 1, 28. Speaking to the man and the woman, right? Because male and female together are the image of God. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. What was God's command? to fill the earth, flip back over. What are they afraid is gonna happen? They're gonna fill the earth. They're afraid of being scattered, even though God told them to do that very thing. So on the one hand, they're building a capital and there's nothing wrong with that. On the other hand, they're building a city and there's nothing wrong with that. They're building a tower and in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with building a tower, but they're building the tower for the purpose of making a name for themselves. Instead of them being God's image bearers, they're wanting their own image to be lifted up. Instead, they're building this tower so everyone will be drawn to them and pursue them instead of everyone pursuing God and being scattered across the earth as God called them to be. They were setting up an idol. Absolutely. Say that. They're drawing their own line. That's right. Yeah, another interesting thing I find about this is when they built the tower with the bricks, they didn't use the mortar like we would consider today. They used the tar. So, and yeah. That seems to be. They're using tar instead of mortar, and they're they're making bricks instead of using stone, which say which is actually saying they decided to build in a place that's less than ideal. There's speculation that this is pri probably right around here, around where Babylon will ultimately be, and this area. When, when the rivers are doing well, it's not a bad area, but it's not an area that it's easy to build in. It's not an area that's easy to live in. But they've just decided we're here and let's make a name for ourselves. It's, it goes, be, you know, I guess I would wanna, this has caused me to want to make a division. You, you use it to, the word pride and that's correct. But I almost wanna make a division between Pride being, sometimes taking pride in your work, that's a good thing, right? This goes beyond pride to arrogance. In our, in our language, we'd divide those words that way, wouldn't we? 
pride tends to not necessarily have the negative ramifications unless we're talking about religious things. Arrogance, whenever we call somebody arrogant, we know what that means, right? So I guess I would say in the negative pejorative sense, when we read the word pride, we can substitute the word arrogant or arrogance. There. Does that make sense? And there's a level of bravado with what they're saying in this. They didn't really learn the lesson from great grandpa Noah's day. Oh, at least maybe they're not being quite as violent or as evil, but it's still not about God. It's still not about following God's rules or God's hopes and plans. Does that make sense? You think I'm reading too much into that or, or is that accurate? Then let's continue the story. Verse five. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they all have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. <clears throat> so on the one hand, it is a form of punishment, yes, but it's a punishment, I guess, for their good, or at least, a punishment so that they end up doing what God knows is best? As parents, you've never done anything like that before, have you? What else do you notice? Or what other questions does it make you ask? And that's where we've kind of got that phrase, this notion of babbling on and a nonsense, a nonsensicalness. And that stems from the story. Akkadian? So on the one hand, in Akkadian, which that's uh, in this area right around the Aaron, the Akkadian word means gateway to God, which is what they had originally intended, wasn't it? Or a gateway to heaven so that they would be the ones looked at. But yet it's become a pejorative word about the nonsense of not being understood. So that depending on the language, so apparently maybe the Akkadian people were some of the ones behind this building. They're some of the ones who maybe, or they're the descendants of the ones who said, no, that was a good idea. We should have completed that. And it's sad that God has to come in and, and create confusion in order to keep people from doing something that's ultimately going to harm them, isn't it? That's right. Now, on the one hand, if they had gone willingly, I don't think that, the, that God would have had to confuse their language. But because they chose to disrespect God, because they chose to try and make a name for themselves, because they chose to try and gather everyone to them, God ultimately had to do something about it. This is going to be one of the very few times in Scripture, post the flood, where God says, you know what? I just have to do something. This is not going to end well. If they keep doing this, it's going to 
It's gonna put them right back in the situation they were prior to the flood. There is a sense of division in that. So online for you guys, uh, many said, so if you're scattering them and you're confusing their languages and that will cause division, it will make dissension, it will make things harder to communicate and therefore it will cause frustrations. And there's, there's a truth to that. But yet by the same token, my gut reaction to that is to say, but there's also a humbling of this. You know, when typically if you're, well, maybe I'm ascribing some thoughts to this, but if a child is disciplined and the discipline does its job and the child is humble, then we'll learn from the error. But not all children learn from the errors, do they? In fact, sometimes when you discipline a child, it hardens their resolve and they just end up doing more. They go the next step and the next step and the next step. For me, as a kid, I was the more submissive one. I didn't like being paddled. If I got paddled once, that was enough to last me for about five or six years. I didn't do anything wrong for a while. And in fact, I disliked being paddled so much that I would make sure to cover for my three brothers so that they didn't get paddled because I didn't like seeing them get paddled. It brought up too many bad memories. Anybody relate to that one? couple of them. By the same token, my brother Aaron, when Aaron would get paddled, he'd be the one who'd look dad square in the eye and say, that didn't hurt. <laughs> Needless to say, Aaron never got just one paddling. He usually got hit three, four, five times. And his pride was such that he would never admit that it hurt. I remember one time Aaron was probably in junior high or something like that. And finally, dad just gave up because he hated swinging his arm. He was just done. Aaron got grounded. There was no more paddling to be had, but he got punished in other ways instead. The reality here is I see God trying to get them to turn to him. Because the one thing that is universally true is it doesn't matter what language you speak, God still knows you, understands you, and hears you. Do we think he understood what happened and what? Probably not at first. Being real honest, it was probably very chaotic. We don't, you know, there's, there's a sense in which this would have been utter chaos for a while until they started to find people who spoke the same language as them until they could divide up and find safety. It, it probably, I mean, I think that that's why over here in verse 25 of chapter 10, Eber, who was apparently there, when he starts having kids, he says, no, this kid was born during the division. Peleg, this is when things went crazy. You get what I'm saying? That's the way I would read this. That the division he's talking about comes here in chapter 11 whenever everybody was one language. We were all one family. Yeah, we didn't necessarily always get along, but we were all one family and we were working together. And then God divided us. Something went wrong. And now we don't talk to them anymore because we can't talk to them. We can't figure out how to communicate with them. And ultimately, until you get to the era where we start writing things down, the people groups kind of stay to themselves until we learn how to communicate beyond language, until people are willing to be humble. There's no way to translate from one language to another. We live in an era where most of the translation work is done for us. If you're willing to take the time, we have books that will translate language for you. We have phones that have Google Translate. And you can, okay, you know, when, when we had Ji Sung, okay, Ji Sung, say that in Korean. And it would listen to her. And then it, 
put it in English. Oh, okay, now I get what you're saying. Because she didn't understand the English language as well. We have tools to help us beyond that. But if you don't have those tools, and even with those tools, there's a level of humility that is required for two people who speak different languages with different cultures to really understand one another. Am I making sense? And let's face it, if there was this level of arrogance and pride, that humility probably was not present for a while. Does that make sense? Kind of, it, it kind of is like it is today. We're, there, there are definitely people who think that they're better than others. And, and English, by the same token, is becoming a universal language. And so there's a sense in which if you can speak English, you can accomplish almost anything you want in the world today. There are still some areas where that's not true. But for the most part, it's unifying us again. And for the most part, it's a good thing. But in some ways, there's, there's division. And it, you know, I'm thinking of in my lifetime since, you know, I've been old enough to pay attention. We've had, you know, the Persian Gulf conflicts. You have Arab speaking peoples and non-Arab speaking peoples. The English speakers and the Arab speakers seem to be at war with each other. And there's something about the Arab culture that says, no, you need to speak my language. I'm not gonna speak your language. Even their religion, the Quran is only meant to be read in Arabic. If it's translated into any other language, that's not technically the Quran. So there's a sense in which there's that national pride that's there that we don't understand and we don't get. And it makes it hard to find peace in the midst of that. Now, I'm not saying that we're necessarily better than them, though sometimes I feel like we are. I'm, I'm proud of them. So the, the Muslim faith happened about somewhere in the 500s AD. Um, Dean, you got, what were you? Oh, okay. The Islamic faith happened about 500 AD. The Jewish faith as we know it has, is over 4,000 years old. That's what most of the Old Testament is built on. Although the Jewish faith as we know it today, the Old Testament as we know it today didn't really come into existence until around 500 AD. Um, that's part of the reason why you see the division between the Samaritans and the Jews in the New Testament. The Samaritans didn't use all the books of the Old Testament that the, the Jewish people did, uh, but they were still descendants of it. Um, those are the three big face that come from this one family situation. Um, I could talk to you about other world religions, but they don't play as much into the story unless someone's got a question about a specific one. So these face come from this group over here as they move further and further east, they get disconnected from this world. And there are, if you were to read like uh, Buddha's writings, if you were to read some of the Hindu faith pieces where there are a lot of parallels, you know, almost all the world religions have a, a central set of things that are very true about them. They overlap. And I think that's because all truth is God's truth. And so these families that migrated east took some of that truth with them. And over the time, it changed, it morphed, it, it kind of became what it was. So you have Hinduism down here, you have Buddhism and Shinto up here. Uh, actually, this area right here is where you get Zoroastrianism, which to be honest with you, um, a lot of Christians actually are far more that way than they are Christian. In Zoroastrianism, there are two gods, a good God and a bad God, and they are at war with each other. You ever hear somebody talk about Satan at the level of being equal to God, they far more act that way. 
And the other thing is, is that religion has made a comeback because they, um, lead singer of Queen, he was a Zoroastrianist. And, and so one of their big uh, things is they don't bury their dead, they burn their dead. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with cremation, but that's a different faith practice that has kind of crept into our culture and our society. Not saying it's wrong, not saying it's bad, but it stems from that faith tradition that's all but dead, but it still does exist in this area of the world. There are still some Zoroastrians there. So some of that, I think, does come from a, a, a changing of the language. Do we still have an influence of that practice, Taoism? Oh, yeah. Mostly Eastern, but there's some here in America. Let's face it, we're the melting pots. So we got a little bit of everything. So what do you think of this story? It's not the cute little story we got told in Sunday school, is it? I mean, it's there. It's, it, no, I'm not picking on you, Nancy, but it's kind of like Noah's Ark. You know, we get told this story and it's kind of cutesy and but there's a lot of other things behind that, isn't there? The Tower of Babel, I was always told as a kid, it was a, it was a sad point in human history, but when you know a little more of the story, it makes it far worse, doesn't it? We're just a handful of generations away from the flood, and yet here they are starting to go in the same path and the same way of doing it. It very well could be. So I don't know if you guys online could hear Melissa, but she asked if the different languages is part of the reason why there are so many different religions. And I think that there might be some truth to that. The reality is I think there's, a, there's so many different denominations within Christianity because rather than continually seeking the Holy Spirit, we start to get arrogant about what we believe and we start to get firm and we tell everybody else they're wrong and you got to believe it my way. Does that sound familiar? Did we just read a story about that? And so I think that there is a sense in which some of the world religions probably do stem from this point. But some of that is because we don't have the humility ourselves to keep going back to God and making sure we've got it right. We start thinking, I can do this myself. I've got it figured out. Every Don, I'm not for sure what you are asking by your question. Move on. Okay. You if you can ask me later. Any other questions about this story? The first line Ah, okay. okay. So verse seven, it starts with, come, let us go down. That's what mine says. And I'm reading from NRSV. Anybody else to say something different there? Okay, I'm just going to say, our jar, the, this kind of is in that realm of the heavenly host. Is this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit talking amongst each other to come down? Or is this God saying to his angels, we've got to go deal with this? Is this God, the angels, and all the other spiritual creatures that I, I'm not 100% certain what that us is, but it's clear that God the Father is speaking. At bare minimum, it's probably the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. At least they're coming down. But I think that this is probably 
probably a broader sense of God speaking to all the heavenly hosts. Oh, I think that is very significant. So, for those of you online, Mandy just said, think about how bad it had to be that God says, I've got to come down and deal with this. And we think it's bad now, but think of how bad it would have had to have been that God says, no, nope, we've got to come deal with this. Now, the other side of that is I think these two realities are related to each other. This conversation we've been having about languages and different religions and this statement right there. I think that God has declared to the spiritual host, this is not good. We need to deal with it. And the unfortunate side to this is I think there are some nefarious spiritual beings who are like, ah, we have an opportunity now. They don't speak the same language, so we can kind of twist their understanding of God. In the same way that we see the devil always trying to, he gives us just enough truth, right? And then he twists it just a little bit to where it leads us away from God. I think there's a reality that's going on in this moment here that allows for all these different world religions. Because now all of a sudden, you know, the devil and his minions can come in and, and not just, he, he can use the language to his own benefit. Does that make sense? Now, again, that's in the jar. I'm admitting we're talking about this jar stuff that I don't fully comprehend, but it seems to make sense to me that if God told the heavenly hosts, and we know from our own belief system that, that you know, a third of the angels went with Lucifer when he fell from heaven, and there's all these demons that it constantly talks about. I mean, uh, you know, I read a, a story for the youth last night, and it was using the story of the man who is possessed by the legion of demons. There's a bunch of them in this one guy that Lucifer and his minions, he's got lots of them. They're going to use whatever they can. And I think he absolutely uses our language against us. He uses miscommunication against us. Jesus calls him the father of lies. And so there's a sense in which I think that there are true believers of Christ all across the world. If you read stories of missionaries, we, you, you get stories of them going into Central America and South America. You get them going into deepest parts of Africa, into Asia, and they tell people about God. They tell people about Jesus, and they're like, we know that story. We don't use those names, but we know that story. We know that God. I think God has always been revealing himself, but I think... The devil has been always trying to pull us away from that. And so I think that this does point to a reality here that God always makes his plan clear. He's, he said from the beginning, I'm making you to spread over the earth. I'm making you to be in relationship with me. He said from the very beginning, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to find a way. Even in the curse on Eve, remember, he says there will come a day whenever your seed will actually conquer the seed of the serpent. So from the very beginning, God has made his plan clear. The problem is we as humanity don't always follow the plan. Either we forget the plan, we get distracted, something always happens that causes us to veer off track. Or we think we have a better idea. Or we think we have a better idea, and that falls into that pride to arrogance. And we see it happening right here from the beginning. And so, as you said, Mindy, yeah, God has to step in again. Now, he's not flooding the earth this time. He's like, I'm not going that far, but we're going to do the next best thing, I guess. And we'll just make sure that you guys can't talk to each other anymore. You go to your room, you go to your room, you go to your room, and none of you come out. We're not even eating family meals together anymore. Sitting at different tables. Now, the other side to that is as much as this spreads the image of God over the whole earth, I will say that as Christians, one of the first things God does in the New Testament 
After the resurrection of Christ, one of the first things God does is he sends the Holy Spirit and he allows everyone to understand the message in their own language. So all the negative side of this moment, God reverses. And if you read that, that story of Pentecost, it says that he gives them the ability to speak the language of the people. And it gives the people the ability to understand in their own language. He's not saying he changes their language. He just simply allows us to bridge that gap. Auto-translate. Auto <laughs> but it's for the sake of helping people to understand the truth. Does that make sense? So in a sense, God scatters the people so that they'll stop trying to collectively lift themselves up. And in hopes, he's, I believe he's doing so to, to humble them and help them hopefully turn back to him. And some of them do. And some of them don't. And unfortunately, we already see our adversary uses this and takes advantage of it for his purposes. And so I want to close the jar and put it back on the shelf. I don't want to say it's the opposite of Babel, but it's the completion of Babel. God's purpose in separating them was so that they wouldn't lift themselves up. And in Pentecost, God rebridges the gap so that everyone can hear his message completely. Because it, it doesn't reverse Babel. He doesn't get rid of the differences of languages. Does that make sense, Amy? I think it's more Right. It's more about hearing the Holy Spirit's voice instead of hearing the person. Does that make sense? I hope. Okay, Amy, thumbed up. All right, good. Any other thoughts? Amen. The realities of languages and cultures and faiths, we can see those as barriers or we can see them as opportunities. And in order to bridge those divides, it requires a level of humility that we're not always very good at, are we? But to hear you tell that story of you and your Jewish friend and how years and years and years of you just respecting her Jewish faith and her respecting your Christian faith and you walking beside each other allowed God to speak in a way that wouldn't happen otherwise. And so you look at our world today, especially if you're on social media, where we're quick to jump to vitriol, where we're quick to jump to, to defending ourselves and making our point. In many ways, we're falling into our own version of Babel, aren't we? We got 12 minutes. And the rest of chapter 11 is more genealogy. You want me to read into that or do we have anything else we need to discuss before we hop into that? Let's see if we can get through the rest of the chapter then. These are the descendants of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of our fact set. Two years after the flood, and Shem lived after the birth of our fact set 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arphaxad had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. 
And our facts had lived after the birth of Sheila 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sheila had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And Sheila lived after the birth of Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg. And Eber lived after the birth of Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he became the father of Ryu. And Peleg lived after the birth of Ryu 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ryu had lived 32 years, he became the father of Siru. And, and Ryu lived after the birth of Siru 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Siru had lived 30 years, he became the father of Nahor. And Siru lived after the birth of Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah and had and Nahor lived after the birth of Terah 199 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. I'm gonna stop right there. First of all, you see this taking the, the format we had a couple weeks back, right? Where we saw their the age and they lived so long when they had this. Uh, so we see that we're picking back up with the lineage that the rest of the story is going to follow, right? Um, did anybody do the math to see when Peleg was born after the flood? Shem was born two years after the flood, right? No, our facts said, our facts said was born two years after the flood. Facts had 35 years, so 37 years had Sheila. Sheila, Sheila, 30 years, so we're at <clears throat> 62 years, right? 67 years. And then another 34 years, so that's 101 years. <clears throat> so within a hundred years of the flood, the Tower of Babel happened. That's not going to be very long, is it? By the same token, what's happened in America in the last hundred years? How far have we drifted from where we were a hundred years ago? I'm not very old and I've lived long enough to see we've drifted. I'm certain many of you guys have seen that too. So maybe we can cut them a little slack, right? I'm not 100% certain on that. So Melissa's question is, is it just a specific son's family that caused this? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I think it, they intentionally don't name anyone with the Tower of Babel on purpose. But I think there's this, I think it's, it, as much as it's not putting the blame on any one person, it's also putting the blame on everyone. Don says, and now wanting to erase history, we sure won't learn from our history doing that. That's true. And Amy, how quick, how we forget the lessons. You know, I think there's a sense in which the story of the Tower of Babel doesn't list anyone particular on purpose. Because on the one hand, they don't want to blame one person that everybody else would then blame that family or this line or this nation. But on the other hand, there's a sense of just like in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches a sermon that says you, and he's talking to everyone, you have killed Jesus. We ultimately know as Christians, I'm responsible for Jesus's death. Doesn't matter if any of the rest of you are, I've sinned enough that Jesus needed to die for my sins. The reality of the Tower of Babel is we're all responsible for that. We all sometimes live into that level of pride and arrogance where we stop following God's way and we start wanting to follow our own way, where we stop being concerned about making a name for God for taking God's image over the whole earth 
And instead we want to make a name for ourselves and we want to be the center. We all have that proclivity within us, don't we? And so I think that that's my personal opinion. I know I could be wrong. I'm definitely willing to admit I'm wrong and you'll definitely tell me when I'm wrong, so. Anything else you notice about this list? Anything that stood out to you? Well, Shem lives 500 some odd years, but the rest of them don't. Shem lives 500, there's a couple hundred, but if you notice with each generation, the length is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. There's a marked difference with each generation that it's not, they're not living as long as the ones before. Now I have here, there's one left. I don't know if anybody thinks of this. But remember me giving you guys this? For those of you online, I did this timeline. And if you look, if you had it, you can look at it, but you can see Shem's line. Shem was alive all the way from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You start to see how the with each successive generation, they start living less and less and less. That makes sense? But ultimately, the reality is, by the time we go into the exile, and especially everyone coming out of the exile, God's promise of 120 years is absolutely true. Now, part of that is, I think we need to learn a lesson is that God makes a promise. He will ultimately fulfill that promise, but he may not necessarily do so immediately. Think back to the first sin of eating the fruit. You shall surely die. He didn't mean they would die immediately. They still lived a long life and had to deal with the consequences of their actions. God, because of the flood, he says, I'm going to limit their life to 120 years. And he does winnow them down. And now most people in the United States where we've got halfway decent health care, it's what men were 72 and ladies, you're like 84 or something like that is the average lifespan. So we're, we don't even get close to that hardly anymore. Does that help? I mean, you can see the trend real clear. Uh, Don, I think I emailed it out, but if I didn't, make sure and I'll just send it out to everybody, okay? This uh, timeline. So I'll send that to everybody, email it out. Before you do that, a lot of these black on dark don't show up. Well, I could take away the colors if that would make it easier. The reason why I went with the different colors is so you could distinguish one bar from another. I made this in Microsoft Paint 15 years ago. I actually can't do that. <laughs> if this was something I had made a couple weeks back, yes, modern technology. This was made 15 years ago on a really old computer by now standards. No, I, unfortunately, I don't have the ability to do that. And I'm sorry for that. Yeah, I, there's a part of me that wants to remake it. I think whenever I made this the first time, I spent like eight hours doing it. Melissa was there and she's like, why are you doing this? That's a waste of time. Well, I've used it for 15 years, so it's not a total waste, but... <clears throat> If it, yeah, if it's on a computer, you can make it a little bigger and maybe you can see that better. But uh, we have a couple minutes left. You want to finish the chapter? So, verse 27, Genesis 11, verse 27. Now, these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was a father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth. In Ur of the Chaldeans, Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, 
And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Is Iska. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai and his son Abram's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. These days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So what do you notice? Women are being mentioned a lot. All of a sudden, women are being mentioned a lot. Yes. It's showing their importance to the story. What else do you notice? For the sake of geography, Ur of the Chaldeans is right over here. What we would probably call modern day Kuwait, about that area. Uh, Haran, where Terah dies, is way up here. Canaan, of course, we know is over here. Just to put that in perspective, if you were to make that trip today, it'd be like starting in Washington, D.C., walking up to Toronto, Canada, and back down to about Evansville, Indiana, on foot. Just to kind of show you the scope of land we're talking about. Any thoughts on what is called prehistory as we finish the first 11 chapters? It is the first time they've ever mentioned a woman being barren. Yeah, the go forth and multiply thing is all of a sudden now being hindered, isn't it? Any other thoughts? Do you guys want to continue with Genesis? Okay, we'll continue with Genesis next week then. Uh, The story is changing at this point. And it goes from this broad stroke story of the first 11 chapters to now we're gonna start talking about one man and one family. That makes sense? Now, just for clarity's sake, I'm gonna say this now and we'll talk about it more next week. There's not a whole lot about Abram that makes him necessarily better than anybody else. But the reality is God has to start somewhere. There's always going to be a first person, right? So I, on the one hand, I, I, as we're going to read about Abram's family, I don't want to necessarily say that his family is better. They just happen to be the one that God chose and the one that God is going to work through. And we're going to see that they are not always all that good. And we're going to see that sometimes they are good. They're a mix like the rest of us. Does that make sense? So with that, let's pray. Lord, when we read our story, when, our, when we read our history, we get a glimpse into the reality of who we are today. And sometimes it truly saddens us that, Lord, we just haven't learned the lessons. And yet, by the same token, it's evident that because your spirit is within us, because you came and lived amongst us, Lord, that you changed the trajectory of humanity. And Lord, we're not nearly as bad as we could be. And for that, we give you praise. We just pray that somehow that we might continue to be open to your Holy Spirit, that we would listen to you, that we would follow you, and Lord, that we would glorify you by all that we say and do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, blessings to you all. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. And we will see you next week with chapter 12. Yes, I'll put a picture of the map with the nations and I'll send that out with email as well.